Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to today's um, academic meeting. Thanks for joining us for those of you that are in person. And for those that are online and are still in the hospital or close by, if you could join us um, in the seminar room in Area 553. So today we have a guest speaker who needs no introduction, Professor Rao, who's been the academic head of endocrinology for many years, is um, retired for just over a year now. I think this will be his first academic meeting in medicine since then. Um, Prof is known to all of us and maybe has been a mentor to most of us. And I think I've been fortunate to at least train under Prof. Um, and the thing is, I think we all know that Prof is an NRFA rated scientist and has been recognized for the Web of Science highly cited researcher for many years in a row. And actually this year, the only Web of Science um, highly cited researcher, but he doesn't come without hard work. Um, for those of you that are here early in the morning, Prof is here before the sun rises and he's the last to leave usually at the sunset. So I think we just need to acknowledge that it, he's worked a lot and contributed a lot in terms of the lipid field. Prof's main area of research has been that of familial hypercholesteremia. And today he's gonna to enlighten us on what's new in lipids. And perhaps it'll also give us a little bit of awareness in terms of the fine FH program, which Prof is leading. And um, yeah, we look forward to the talk. Great, thanks so much, Zonek. And yeah, okay, perfect. Hopefully you can all hear me, uh, those that are dialing in. But what I thought I'd just do is um, just update you on what's new in the sort of lipid field. Um, those are my disclosures. Um, I have done many trials with uh, novel lipid lowering agents. Um, so um, in including the newer drugs that I'm going to sort of discuss. So just to put things in perspective, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease peaked in the 1970s. So that's about 50 years ago. And then with the discovery of statins, uh, with the fancy drug eluting stents, et cetera, uh, there has been a reduction in deaths from cardiovascular disease. But it still remains the biggest killer worldwide. So just to put things in perspective, I just did a Google this morning. There's been about 700 million cases of COVID, about 7 million deaths from COVID. But that's since the onset of the COVID pandemic, which was four years ago. So that's 7 million people in four years. This is 20 million people per year. So this pandemic of cardiovascular atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease is about 10 times the, the, the size of the COVID pandemic. Um, there are now multiple lines of evidence to show that cholesterol, particularly LDL, is causative. So epidemiological studies, genetic studies, clinical trials, animal experiments have all shown that uh, LDL cholesterol is causal of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And that's why all the guidelines, and this is just the European uh, guidelines, now make LDL the target for treating um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And particularly in high-risk patients, so patients with established atherosclerosis or at very high risk, the goal is to reduce LDL by at least 50% and also to try and achieve a target that's much lower than previously. That's an LDL target of 1.4 millimoles per liter. One of the problems, that's what the guidelines say, how do we do? And this is uh, data from the Eurospire study. So every three or four years, they look at how well physicians are doing in Europe. And you can see in terms of cholesterol, uh, particularly secondary prevention, two thirds of patients or more are not at target and over 50% of primary prevention patients are not, not at target. Now, why is that so? This was an interesting study called the Da Vinci study, which just looked at what physicians are prescribing for patients with atherosclerosis or at high risk. And you can see the majority of patients, 50% are only on moderate dose statins, less than uh, a third are on high intensity statins, and very few are on combination therapy with, for example, azetimibe, only 9%, or the fancy new drugs that I'll be speaking about. So. When we look at the current recommended goal of 2019, uh, only a third of patients are achieving the target. 
So we must remember atherosclerosis is quite a complex uh, process. The lipids, which I think is pivotal, but there's also, as you know, inflammation. And particularly during the acute event, there's a clot or a thrombus on the ruptured plaque. So those are all important. It's a complex pathway, but I'm just going to try and convince you that uh, there's now a lot of evidence that lipid is causal. And the reason we haven't got on top of atherosclerosis is that we probably haven't reduced LDL cholesterol sufficiently. And maybe we've got to look at the other uh, lipoproteins that are involved in the atherosclerotic process. So I'm not going to talk about inflammation and anticoagulation. I'm just going to concentrate on additional lipoprotein reduction. And there are three real plays in the field. LDL is still pivotal, and I'll explain that's the, in, at least in the fasting state, 95% of atherogenic lipid pro, lipoproteins in the circulation is LDL cholesterol. But the other, there's another two which are remnants, so what we call the triglyceride rich lipoproteins, and then an interesting thing called lipoprotein little a. So we have to look at all those three components if we want to try, try and eradicate atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease reducing LDL further, looking at reducing remnants, and then possibly also looking at reducing lipoprotein little a. Okay, so the standard therapy for most patients is statins, uh, uh, which we underutilize at the top dose, and we don't use azetimibe much. But assuming your patient is on top dose statin plus azetimibe, there are still many patients that can't achieve these much lower targets, the LDL of 1.4, those are patients with atherosclerosis. So the newer drugs um, that are now available or becoming available are drugs directed against PCSK9, I'll tell you what that is just now, and then newer drugs like the ANGPD3 inhibitors. So when we look at trying to get LDL cholesterol down further, there are drugs that depend on upregulating the LDL receptor. So just to remind you about statins, they are remarkable drugs. As you know, they're one of the biggest drugs prescribed in the world. But unfortunately, when we double the dose of a statin, when we go from 20 to 40 milligrams or 40 to 80, we don't get double the effect. So you, you only get a further 6% reduction in LDL cholesterol when you double the dose of the statin. And we were never sure why that was the case, but we now know that when we give statins, which mainly act by upregulating the LDL receptors on the cell, at the same time that also upregulate a funny thing called PCSK9, which stands for pro-protein converter texan type 9, and that is like the break in the system. So when you're giving a statin, you upregulate the receptors, but it, you're putting your foot on the accelerator, but at the same time, you're putting it on, on the break. So this is just a, a, a figure that shows what PCSK9 is. It's produced by the, mainly by the liver. If it attaches to the LDL receptor, which is that funny little brown looking thing there, that LDL receptor is taken to the lysosome and destroyed. So if you can block or get rid of PCSK9, in this case with a monoclonal antibody, the LDL receptors, none of them get broken down in the lysosome and they all return to the cell surface. So the cell gets covered with LDL receptors. Uh, and this uh, PCSK9 was really only discovered about 15 years ago, but a remarkable therapy. This is one of the studies that we were involved in with a monoclonal antibody. Um, called Evolocumab, and in our patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, on top of statin and azetimibe, we gave them this monoclonal antibody, which is an injection every two weeks, and it lowered LDL by a further 60%. Uh, there are now outcome studies. This is the Fourier study with that drug called Evolocumab. There's another one with, called the Odyssey Outcomes with Alirocumab. These are monoclonal antibodies which showed in big studies um, reduction in major cardiovascular events. So these PCSK9 inhibitors are now very good uh, additional therapies for patients that we can't get to target. Just how they work. So a PCSK9 monoclonal antibody, you administer it by injection, 
it mops up all the PCS canine within the circulation. So shown in yellow there, PCS canine sort of decreases to virtually zero in the circulation. But within about two weeks, because it's continuing to be produced by the liver, the levels of PCS canine start increasing. So if you look at the LDL levels with this therapy, you get a good reduction. But then after about two weeks, the level starts increasing. Again, that's why you've got to keep giving this stuff every two weeks. So rather than giving monoclonal antibodies, which are really cleaning up the PCS canine be, uh, being produced, the latest sort of therapy to reduce um, PCS canine is actually to turn off the tap to prevent the production of PCS canine by the liver. And that's with, with gene silencing using what we call small interfering RNA. It's a drug called Inclisiran that was actually launched uh, in South Africa about two weeks ago. So it's now just become available uh, for use in South Africa. So what's happening in the lipid field? We're moving away from the traditional small molecules like statins as NMI because there you're relying on patient compliance tablets every day. We're moving away from the biotics, the monoclonal antibodies. And we're moving towards this, the, the uh, uh, nucleic acid-based therapies, either antisense oligonucleotides or small interfering RNA. So this is just the, the two ways you can do it. Antisense oligonucleotides also have to be given by injection uh, or small interfering RNA, and they inhibit the production of, of whatever, you, or whatever your target is, for example, PCSK9. So this is in Clisaran. This is the drug, a small interfering RNA, which uh, turns off the production of PCS canine by the liver. Uh, so unlike the monoclonal antibodies that have to be given every two weeks, um, this small interfering RNA gets into a complex called the RNA-induced silencing complex within the liver, and it stays there for six months or longer. So this therapy can get, be given much less frequently. These were the sort of studies um, with this drug called Inclisaran. It was called the Iran. The injection was given at the beginning. Just... Sorry about that. Somebody was uh, not silenced or not on mute, so I had some background interference. So just to mention, so this was the program we were involved in where, with this drug called Inclisran, which in all the studies that were given at the beginning, at three months, and then every six months. Um, and the summary of these three studies showed that if you added it to a statin and a zetamide, on average, you get about a 50% further reduction in cholesterol. Um, we don't yet have outcome studies with this medication, but if you put those three studies together, you can see that the use of this therapy is very similar to the monoclonal antibodies, reduces cardiovascular events in the order of 20 to 25%. So this is potentially a newer therapy with very infrequent dosing, um, after the first year, only twice a year, it's like a vaccine really, that will keep your LDL cholesterol reduced by about 50%. So I've concentrated mainly on LDL. So as I mentioned in the fasting states, 90% uh, or more of atherogenic lipoproteins in the circulation, as shown in the dark blue here, is LDL cholesterol. But maybe in order to eradicate atherosclerosis, we also need to look at those other little components, uh, the remnants and lipoprotein little a, which is shown in yellow there, which is a tiny segment of the pie, but it's a very interesting uh, additional atherogenic uh, uh, particle. So I've spoken about LDL, and now we've got good therapies to get that down, statins, azenimab, and the PCS canine inhibitors. And I'm just going to be talking about addressing the other two atherogenic particles, LP little a and remnants. So for, first of all, what is remnant cholesterol? Um, it's hard to measure directly, but it's basically 
as shown in the red block there, if you take a total cholesterol and you and you take away the HDL, which is the, meant to be the good cholesterol, and LDL, what is left is remnant cholesterol. And what remnant cholesterol really is are triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Um, so they're larger than LDL cholesterol because they contain triglyceride. Uh, they're much more prevalent in patients with a metabolic syndrome, diabetes, et cetera, because we know often that triglycerides are slightly high in those patients. But interestingly, per particle, they, are, they contain more cholesterol than LDL cholesterol, and they're more pro-inflammatory than LDL cholesterol. So although there are many fewer around, they probably are fairly pro-atherogenic. How do we reduce these remnant particles? Now, everyone thought fibrates were the best drug for addressing these particles. And everyone was waiting for the outcome of this study called the Prominent Study, which was published um, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 20, 2022. And it was extremely disappointing because it did nothing in terms of cardiovascular, although it reduced remnants, it didn't reduce cardiovascular risk. So this is how well it worked in the study. You can see the remnants came down about 25%, but there's a thing called beta shift. So when you reduce, or you like with a fibre, you reduce um, the remnants, some of them convert into LDL cholesterol. So you can see in this study, LDL cholesterol went up, and the APOB, which is the sum total of all atherogenic lipoproteins, also went up. So I think this is sort of the nail in the coffin for the fibrates. We only really should be using fibrates for very high triglycerides when there's a risk of pancreatitis. Uh, it must be remembered, this is comparing a fibrate called femidofibrate with a PCSK9 inhibitor. And if you look at remnants, which is non-HDL basically in summary, shown in blue here, the PCSK9 inhibitors are much, much better at reducing remnants than fibrates. So it's a good option if you, uh, rather than a fibrate, to consider a PCSK9 inhibitor. But what about other drugs that may be able to reduce remnants specifically? Uh, and I've shown a list here, but the most important newer agents are what we call the ANG PTL3 inhibitors. And the most advanced under that is a drug called Evanacumab, which is also a monoclonal antibody. But as you can see, there are also small interfering RNA drugs being directed against ANG PDL3. So what is ANG PDL3? It's a big word as well. It's called angiopotin like three. Um, and it's a circulating protein uh, present in the bloodstream, produced only by the liver, and it inhibits what we call lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase. So there are patients around that have been found in the world that don't have ang 3 and they have very low triglyceride levels and low LDL cholesterols, and also interestingly low HDL, but they don't get atherosclerosis. So this evidence where if you're lacking ang pdl 3 you seem to be protected from atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, both in humans and in animal models, et cetera, suggested that maybe we should try and inhi inhibit ang pdl 3 So we did the pivotal study in our patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, where we added this drug to statin azetamide plus a PCS canine inhibitor. And remarkably, this drug reduced LDL cholesterol by a further 50%. It has to be given by an infusion, a drip every month. But for homozygous patients, this is a remarkable therapy, unfortunately, very expensive. Now, how does it work um, in homozygous FH who don't have LDL receptors? We're not in entirely sure, but we think this drug works independently of the LDL receptor. So in homozygous patients, it doesn't depend on having LDL receptors or not, and it's very, very effective. But it's potentially a drug, we know it works in homozygous FH, but it potentially can work across the spectrum and can get rid of the remnant particles which are pro-atherogenic. So there are many studies with uh, these therapies now that are looking at patients with high remnant particles uh, mixed 
dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, and diabetes. Okay. Just out of interest, what happens if you combine all these things together? And uh, ANG PDL3, PCSK9, plus statin. And in animal models, you can get like marked regression of atherosclerosis. This is a little uh, one of our patients that uh, uh, Brett Mansfield is in the audience. Actually, um, we put it in as a as a case report in the Lancet a few months ago. And this is one of our patients with homozygous FH who, uh, on the combination with the ANG PDL3 inhibitor, you can see that there was regression. This was uh, over about a year. You can see that these then large xanthoma over her hands over this year period regressed with this combination uh, therapy. So a remarkable therapy for homozygous FH. Just to mention, we can also target APOC3, and that also gets rid of remnants. So there are two ways to get rid of remnants. I don't think there's a place for fibrates, but potentially in the future, ANG, uh, PTL3 inhibition or inhibiting APOC3 both will reduce remnants markedly. So, and that's supported by the genetic evidence. I've told you about LDL, ANG PDL3, APOC3, and then lastly, what about lipoprotein little a? So lipoprotein little a is a very interesting molecule. It consists of basically the LDL particle, but it's got this funny little tail called APO little a attached to it. As mentioned, it's only, it's, Pre prevalent, its presence is much less in the circulation than LDL cholesterol. But interestingly, if you look at um, genetic studies, genome-wide association, the uh, LP little a is shown to be an independent risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and interestingly, also for aortic stenosis. So drugs, we didn't, weren't able to lower LP little a effectively. PCSK9 inhibitors reduced it modest, modestly, but there are now drugs under development, both small interfering RNA again and ASOs, that can reduce LP little a by 80% or more. So that was one of the first drugs, but there are several like Pelo, uh, these drugs here, Pelocarsin or Passerin SLM360, which can reduce uh, LP little a 80% or more. And there are now studies uh, uh, that are in progress to see if by inhibiting or reducing LP little a, maybe we will also get further prevention or regression of atherosclerosis. So in the lipid field, what has changed is we've moved away from small molecules, although there's still the, the background of therapy like the statins, We've moved towards the protein basis on the monoclonal antibodies, but the future are going to be um, these RNA drugs, siRNAs and ASO therapies. And that's going to be the future because they can be given much less frequently and you have guaranteed compliance if you administer these drugs because you're not relying on the patient taking them every day. And those are the targets I've mentioned, APOC3 and ANG pdl 3 PCSK9, and, and LP little a or APO a. So this was a very uh, good editorial written by Peter Libby that was in the European Heart uh, in 2022, just to show we're moving away from the daily therapy, which is very dependent on compliance towards much less frequent therapy and hopefully in the future gene therapy, which is once and done. And we're gonna be involved in gene therapy, hopefully, and about later in the year, about the middle of the year. So Fazana is, is going to be the PR in one of these studies with gene therapy where we edit and we fix the problem. Uh, so just to end off with, um, what's happened in terms of the treatment of LDL? So we know that high is bad. We then try to get lower is better, but probably we're not doing well enough. So lowest is best. Um, and how low should we be going? So Goldstein and Brown, who you probably know, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the LDL receptor and the way cholesterol is metabolized inside the cell. This was a paper many years ago published in Metabolism in 1977, where they estimated that the ideal LDL cholesterol level in man should be about 0.7 millimoles per liter. The current target we're recommending is 1.4. Interestingly, we're born with an LDL cholesterol of about one. 
if you don't have familial hypercholesterolemia. All the studies show if you can get the LDL below about 1.7, 1.8 millimoles per liter, that's when you will get regression or prevent progression of LDL uh, of atherosclerosis. So they wrote an editorial with the discovery of the statins uh, called heart attacks gone with a century, and that was the last century, and we know that is not enough. So we need to start probably treating much, much earlier. This is just showing you, I mean, getting to 80 is probably quite a good inning, innings, uh, um, and that's with an LDL cholesterol of around about three. So at 80 years old, your arteries would have been exposed to 80 times three or 240 cholesterol years. If you've got heterozygous FH, your LDL cholesterol is double. So when you're 40 years old, your arteries are already 80 years old. That's why the average age of heart attack is 40, 41 actually in a heterozygous patient. And in the homozygous patients that we see, they have events before the age of 20 because by the age of 20, their arteries are already 80 years old. With all the studies that have been done, the statin trials, the PCS canine studies, patients, the average age of patients enrolled has been 60 years. So they've already had 60 years of developing atherosclerosis within the arteries. It's much, much too late. Uh, we do too little too late. If you look at the genetics, and if for, for a genetic reason, you had an LDL cholesterol one millimole lower, um, which you can achieve with a statin, you should have a much greater effect than achieved with five years of using statin therapy. So this was just some work done from Brian Ferenc that if you said like an FH patient with a baseline LDL about twice normal, six, if you reduced it by 50%, but from a very early age, you would reduce lifetime risk by not 20% or 30%, by, but by over 90%. Do we have any evidence to show that that works? So there's really only one study that I'm aware of, and this is done in the Netherlands, where they start treating the FH children at a very early age. And this was 20 years follow-up of children with FH started on statins from the age of 10 or 12. And you can see compared to the parents, they're outliving their parents. And in fact, their mortality is the same as that of the background healthy population. So it just shows we've got to treat earlier, treat for much longer, and treat to much lower targets. So that's the current guidelines. Um, start early, treat more aggressively, and particularly in our high-risk patients, we've got to think about combination therapy. So just to remind everyone of these targets, that's what we've got to go for. In our high-risk patients shown in red at the bottom, anybody with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, those with chronic kidney disease or diabetes and target organ, organ damage, the LDL target is 1.4, which is much higher than, uh, than what, which is much lower than previously recommended. And our patients all have levels much, much higher than this. So we need to be much more aggressive in lipid lowering therapy in our patients. So what we should do is if you have a patient with atherosclerosis or at high risk, you should look at what the LDL is and estimate how much you need to reduce the LDL to get to that target of 1.4. And right up front, we should be thinking about combination therapy like we do in our patients with hypertension whenever we'll you use single drug therapy anymore. So this was an editorial written by uh, Kosh Ray a few years ago, which saying in our high risk patients, Right up front, we should think about combination therapy, not these newer drugs, but statin plus azetamib as starting therapy. And then if we can't get to target, uh, think about the PCS canine inhibitors. Uh, and this is what the future will be, moving away from daily drugs, as I said, to, to much less frequent therapy to try and achieve these targets in the future. And... The future is going to be not only LDL, but also looking at the other two components. But we don't yet have outcome studies to show that addressing triglyceride-rich remnants and LP little a is going to be of cardiovascular benefit. And I still think our main major target should be, at this point, LDL cholesterol. But it's all about this personalized treatment. We should look at our patients and decide what therapies is most appropriate for them.
So this is really my take home message. I've just tried to explain to you all that uh, atherogenic lipoproteins are still the pivotal risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We need to be more aggressive in lowering all the different fractions, and we need to think upfront about combination therapy, and then in our high-risk patients, the newer therapies that are going to become available to us. Uh, I think hopefully I've just got five minutes. Uh, just for Zana mentioned familial hypercholesterolemia, and just, just to remind you all um, a little bit about FH, because we can now screen for this condition. Uh, it must just be remembered, it's the most common and most serious of the single gene disorders. It affects one in every 311 people or 30 million people worldwide. So we all get taught at medical school about cystic fibrosis and all these funny things. This condition is much, much more frequent, but it's asymptomatic. Uh, these were the older estimates. Now these are the newer estimates you can see in Africa. We, we, uh, the total, we think there's at least 30 million people with familial hypercholesterolemia in the world. And in the African region, probably about 4 million people. It's an autosomal co-dominant condition. So if you inherited from one parent, your cholesterol level is twice normal. Your heart attacks are normally at around about the age of 35 to 40. The rare condition that we see is much less frequent, but there, as I mentioned, heart attacks begin in childhood. Now, the reason to make a noise about, we know a lot about the genetics. We know it's mainly due to uh, mutations in the LDL receptor, but it can be due to mutations in APOB, PCSK9, etc. cetera. Uh, how do we diagnose it? Um, it's still a clinical diagnosis. So there are many tables like this one. There's like the Dutch lipid score. There's the uh, Simon Broom criteria. But this is probably the easiest. If you see a patient with an LDL cholesterol of 5 millimoles or higher, particularly if there's a family history, somebody in the family's had a heart attack or there's early onset cardiovascular disease, bell should ring and you should think about this condition, which, as I, as I mentioned, is totally asymptomatic until the, the patient presents, usually with an event or, unfortunately, in a third of cases, with sudden death. So these are the clinical markers, just to remind you. In the top left, that's Arcus pornealis. That's, if you see that in a patient under 40, it should make you think about FH. Xanthelasma around the eyes in the top right is also remarkable. It's not very specific. Most important is thickening of the Achilles tendons. The reason I've mentioned it and why it's so important in South Africa is the prevalence worldwide is about one in 300, but in certain population groups like our Afrikaner population, our Jewish population, and our Indian population, mainly from Gujarat, the prevalence is one of the highest in the world, about one in 80. So this is, at, we over here on, on, on your right, the Afrikaners and the Jews have a very high prevalence of this condition. And we're missing it big time. Uh, we are not thinking about this condition. If you treat it early, you can save many, many lives and allow these patients to live quite normal lives uh, because we now have very good therapies available. What about in our black African population, which is the majority of our population? This is just a map of electricity around the world, but you can see it's the same for FH. We are clueless. We have, we have about 20 patients with um, black patients with FH at our lipid clinic. I've seen three black patients with homozygous FH in, in, my, in, in my career, but we are totally unaware of the prevalence of familial hypercholesterolemia in our black population. And that's, I think, important to, to emphasize, and we need to think about this condition in them as well. So as Fazana mentioned, we do have a project. It's been generously funded by Evan Stein, who's an ex, uh, he qualified, he's an ex Bitsy, but he gave us um, quite a lot of money to do genetic testing for patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. So any of you out there, if you have a patient who you think may have familial hypercholesterolemia, contact one of us, either myself 
or Fazana or Brett. Those are our email addresses. Those are our cell phone numbers. And we can arrange to see the patient, not only to test the patient, but more important to test the children. Because if you have FH, half your children will inherit the condition from you. If we test the children and we start treating early, the current recommendation is to start treating at the age of eight. We will prolong the lives of those patients uh, dramatically. So it is available. Uh, there's no cost to the patient. All they've got to do is come to see us and put out an arm, give us a blood sample, but we would happily do this testing. So any of you listening there, particularly cardiologists, uh, et cetera, that are seeing patients, with uh, premature atherosclerosis, we need to think about this condition. Uh, and very importantly, for all of you, just remember to take a family history. It's amazing. You know, you see the patient, you treat the acute problem, they come in and you put in a stent or whatever. It's amazing how many physicians, uh, not only uh, doctors, forget to take a family history. That, you know, you want to make sure the mother hasn't got it, the father hasn't got it, and think about screening the children. So I'll end, well, I perhaps leave that slide on for those that want the details, but I'm happy to answer any questions.